have you ever run a pyspark job that took forever to complete or maybe it failed because of memory issues today we will fix that in this video i will teach you how to optimize your pyspark job for speed and efficiency hi everyone welcome back to the data guy your go to channel for mastering data engineering tools and concepts if you are new here i am vishal and i create videos to help you build a strong foundation in data engineering today we will see how you can optimize your pyspark jobs for speed and efficiency so in this video, we will cover partitioning and coalescing, caching and persisting, broadcast joins and handling data stream. So first one is repartition and coalescing. Now in this, uh, we will see what is repartition and coalesce and when to use it. So first, uh, let's talk about partitions in Spark. When Spark process data, it splits the data into chunks called partitions. These partitions are spread across the nodes in your cluster and the more partitions you have, the more parallelism you get, meaning faster processing, right? But sometimes you might have too few or too many partitions and this is where repartition and coalesce come in. So let's start with repartition. Imagine you have a data frame that's split into four partitions, but you have a big Spark cluster with 16 nodes. To take advantage of all that processing power, you might want to increase the number of partitions, let's say from 4 to 16. Now this is where you would use repartition. When you call repartition, Spark reshuffles all the data across the cluster, breaking it into exactly the number of partitions you have specified, in this case for 16. But repartition comes with a cost. Since Spark has to reshuffle all the data across net the network, it can be quite expensive in terms of performance. So use it when you really need to increase parallelism or reorganize your data for performance optimization. Now let's talk about coalesce. This is useful when you want to reduce the number of partitions, like when you're writing data to disk or when you have too many small partitions that are slowing down your job. Coalesce is like the opposite of repartition, but with one big difference. It tries to avoid the heavy data shuffling. So uh, let's say you have a data frame with 16 partitions, but you only need four to make, make your write operation more efficient. You can call coalesce four and Spark will move the data into fewer partitions without the full shuffle that repartition does. So coalesce is much more efficient when you're reducing partitions because it, because it minimizes the networking shuffling. So what's the difference between repartition and coalesce? So here, as you can see, Repartition can do both. It can do uh, increase or decrease the number of partitions, whereas coalesce is used to decrease the number of partitions. Repartition does not worry about the amount of shuffle, and coalesce tries to avoid shuffle. Repartition it is slower than coalesce, whereas coalesce performs better than repartition. So repartition tries to create partitions of similar size. And in coalesce, it out, uh, the output partitions can be uneven in size. So, all right. So, when should you use this? So, use repartition when you want to increase parallelism or redistribute the data evenly across your cluster, usually before an expensive operation like a join or a large aggregation. And use coalesce when you want to decrease the number of partitions efficiently. Like when you're preparing to write the results to a file or reducing the workload after a transformation. So yeah. Now that we talked about how to manage partition using repartition and coalesce. Next, we are going to dive into two more critical concepts in Spark that can really improve the performance of your jobs. Cache and per cache and persist. So if you're dealing with the repeated transformations on the same data frame, these are your go-to tools for making sure you don't recompute the same data over and over again. Now, before we jump into cache and persist, let's quickly talk about how Spark normally process data. Every time you apply an action to a data frame or RDD, like counting the rows or writing the data to storage, Spark will recompute everything from scratch. This means it will go all the way back to your original data source and run through all the transformations you have applied every single time you run an action. If your pipeline is complex, this recomputation can become really expensive. And that's where caching and persisting come in handy. So let's start with cache. 
So when you call the cache method on a data frame or RDD, you're tailing Spark to store the data in memory after it's computed the first time. That way, the next time you perform an action on the data frame, Spark can just pull the data from memory instead of recomputing everything. This is super useful when you have a data frame that's being used in multiple actions or multiple stages of your pipeline. Now, let's say, for example, if, if you have a data frame that you are using for both account and show, normally Spark would recompute everything twice. But if you cache the data frame, it only computes it once and keep it in memory for the next action. So here you, as you can see in the screen, here, how we can use the cache. Com uh, when you use the cache, computation happens there and the result is cached in the memory. So next time you perform any action, so there will be no computation. It will use the cache data. Now let's talk about persist. Persist is like cache, but it gives you more control over where and how Spark stores the data. Well, cache stores the data in memory by default, Persist allows you to specify different storage levels like memory, disk, or combination of both. So for example, if your data is too large to fit entirely in memory, you might want to persist it to both memory and disk. So Spark will use memory for as much as it can and spill the rest to disk. So here you can see that's how you use persist method and you mention here uh, where you want to uh, cache your data in me memory or memory and disk. So uh, you can also use the other storage levels like memory only and disk only. So uh, when to use? So you can use cache when data set is small enough to fit into memory and you're going to reuse it multiple times and use persist when working with large data set or if you need more control over and where the data is stored so these are the different storage levels available in persist memory only memory and disk so here the idd is stored as a deserialized java objects in the jvm memory only serialize so here rdd store as a serialized java objects memory and disk serialize disk only these are the different uh, storage levels available for persist so cache is just a shortcut for persisting the data in memory using the default memory only storage level persist gives you more flexibility by, uh, by allowing you to choose different storage operations like memory and disk both methods are great for avoiding expensive recomputations, but persist is more flexible if you have specific storage requirements or if you're working with larger data sets that can fit entirely in the memory. So one important thing to remember after using cache or persist, don't forget to unpersist the data when you're done with it. This frees up memory and disk space, ensuring your cluster resources are used efficiently. So here you can see, that's how you can unpersist the cache data. So next, move on to broadcast joins. So broadcast joins. This is an awesome optimization trick that's really useful when you're working with large data sets and want to speed up joins. So first, let's talk about how regular joins work in Spark. When, you, when Spark performs a regular join between two data frames, it needs to shuffle the data across your cluster so that rows with matching keys end up on the same partition. This is called a shuffle join. But here is the catch. Shuffling data can be really expensive. It involves moving large amounts of data across the network, which can slow down your Spark job, especially when you're joining two large data sets. A broadcast join is a way to skip the costly shuffle by broadcasting small data frame to all the worker boards in your cluster. So instead of shuffling both data frames to perform the join, Spark sends the smaller data frame to every node in the cluster. That way, each worker node can perform the join locally with the broadcasted data. No need for an expensive shuffles. This is super efficient when one of, the, one of your data frames is small enough to fit into memory on each worker node. So uh, imagine you have two data frames, one large, let's say a billion rows, and one small, let's say a few thousand rows. 
If you try a regular join, Spark will shuffle both data frame across the cluster. But with a broadcast join, Spark sends a copy of the smaller data frame to each worker node. Now every node has the small data frame locally and can join it with the large data frame on that node, avoiding the shuffle together. So here you can see in the diagram here, the small, D, small DF is sent to all worker nodes by using broadcasting. So using a broadcast join in Spark is super easy. All you need to do is tell Spark to broadcast the smaller data frame. You can do this using the broadcast functions. Now here you can perform the broadcast join. You just call this, uh, whichever data frame is called in the broadcast. Now by broadcasting the smaller data frame, you're essentially telling Spark, hey, send this small data frame to all the worker nodes. So we can skip the shuffle and join more efficiently. So uh, Spark can automatically decide to use broadcast joins for you. By default, Spark will automatically broadcast any data frame that's smaller than let's say 10 MB. This behavior is controlled by this uh, spark.sql.auto broadcast join threshold. So you can use this configuration setting to allow Spark to automatically broadcast any data from that's smaller than 50 MB, let's see. Now you also, uh, you can change this threshold if you want to broadcast larger data frames. You can increase this size also. All right, now that we have talked about broadcast joins, let's dive into another important performance issue in Spark data scheme. Data skew happens when your data is not evenly distributed across partitions. In other words, some partitions have way more data than others. This imbalance can lead to certain partitions taking much longer to process than others, causing the entire Spark job to slow down. So let's explore what data skew is, why it's a problem and how to deal with it. Imagine our machine has eight worker nodes instead of three as shown before. Yeah. A perfectly distributed data set would have the same number of rows on each as shown here on the left. A data set, a data set with SKU on the other hand would have a lot of data on some cores and very little data on others. So here you can see on the right side. So while most of the partitions might finish quickly, your job will be held up by the one partition, one partition that's overloaded with data. This is the data skew problem. So data skew can cause several performance issues like it can cause even uneven workload. Some partitions get overloaded while others finish quickly, leading to inefficient resource usage. It can cause memory errors. Hot partitions can cause out of memory errors because too much data is being processed by a single node. So there can be longer execution times. The entire Spark job will take as long as the slowest partition. So even though some tasks finish fast, the overall job is delayed. So in short, data skew is a major bottleneck that can significantly slow down your Spark job. So you can detect the data skew if there are some long running jobs. If some tasks uh, in your Spark job are taking significantly longer than others, that's a sign of skew. Uh, if there are uneven partition sizes, you can use the df.rdd.glom command to inspect the size of each partition. If you see one or more two partitions with way more records than others, you have got skew. Now, if there are out of memory errors on certain partitions, if your job is failing because a few partitions are running out of memory, that could be due to skew. So once you detect skew, it's time to deal with it. Now that we understand what data skew is, let's explore some common strategies to fix it. Use salting to distribute key only. One of the most effective way to deal with skew is by using salting. Salting is when you artificially add a random value to your key column, effectively splitting the skew data across multiple partitions. So how it works? So let's say you're joining or grouping by a highly skewed column like region, you can add a random number salt to the region column, creating additional partitions for the hot trees. So here you can perform this. Here we are adding two column salted, uh, salted key. 
and after adding that you can just perform join or group by by using the salted key now by splitting the skewed key into multiple smaller partitions we are distributing the workload more evenly across your cluster i choose the cluster next one is increase parallelism Another simple way to reduce the impact of skew is to increase the number of partitions for your data frame. You can do this by using repartition to break the data into more partitions, which helps distribute the workload more evenly. By increasing the number of partitions, each partition contains less data, which can help alleviate the effects of skew. But be careful, too many partitions can lead to excessive overhead. So find a balance. Next one is use range partition. If you know your data is heavily skewed in advance, you can use range partitioning to distribute the data more evenly. Range partitioning allows you to manually define ranges for each partition based on the skewed column, ensuring that the data is split more evenly across partitions. For example, if you know most of your data falls within certain values, you can assign smaller ranges to those hotspots to avoid overloading one partition. Next one is Handle skewed joins with skewed join optimization. When performing joins on skewed data, you can also use Spark's built in skew join optimization. This feature automatically detects skewed keys and adjusts the join strategy to balance the node. So, to enable this skew join optimization, you can configure this setting. So, by uh, using this setting, Spark will uh, tries to uh, detect the skewed keys automatically. Now, basically this tells Spark to handle skewed joins by splitting the heavy keys into smaller, more manageable chunks. It's a great way to let Spark optimize the join for you. And that wraps up our deep dive into optimizing Spark performance. In this video, we covered some powerful techniques to help you supercharge your Spark joins, including partition and coalescing, we learn how to effectively manage partitions to balance data and avoid unnecessary shuffles, caching and persisting. We explored how to reuse data efficiently across multiple actions in Spark, reducing computation time, broadcast joins. We saw how broadcasting smaller data frames can eliminate costly shuffles when performing joins, handling data skew. Finally, we tackled the issue of data skew and how to, how to distribute data evenly to ensure that the Spark job runs smoothly. But by applying these techniques, you can significantly improve the performance of your Spark jobs, saving time and resources. Thanks for watching. If you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the Data Guy for more beginner friendly data engineering content and share this video with someone who is just starting out. Have questions or ideas for future videos? Drop them in the comments below. I would love to hear from you. Until next time, happy coding.